I want to begin with a very simple question. What is a prophet? Now, some people in a cheeky way might say something I've not seen in a few years, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people, a prophet. What is a prophet? Now, that's a good question to ask as we look at this part of the Bible storyline because wherever you turn, you'll find prophets. They're the dominant figures. But let me tell you that prophets are a little strange. I was actually thinking if a typical prophet came into our church building today, I suspect that I'd look at them and go, wow, I think you're from the outer edges of society because they're really strange people. I will deal with their strangeness in a moment, but when I mention the word prophet or job description of prophet to someone, most people will tell me prophets are people who tell the future. They pronounce what's about to happen and everyone sits back and waits and they watch to see if it will happen and then if it does, we all cheer and if it doesn't, we go and find another prophet and listen to them. But when you read the prophets, you realise that they're not that easy to deal with. In fact, they're a really strange and bizarre group of largely men. There are some female prophets and all of them together are a strange group of people. They've got a lot of sharp edges in today's society, we'd say they're a little bit prickly. And let me tell you about a few of them. Jeremiah, well, he had his own set of special underwear, which he had to bury and then dig up as an example for God's people about a certain aspect of God's word. In fact, after he'd done that and during his life, he actually had to spend a large period of his time walking around with an oxen yoke over his head and shoulders. Neil, we won't ask you to do that after Saturday. Hosea, for those who have been in Bible study this week, was commanded by God to find a prostitute and marry her and to endure her consistent adultery. Elijah, well, he survived in the wilderness on meat that was brought to him by crows. Ezekiel had to lie on his left side for 300 days and turn over on his right side for 40 days as a living example of God's judgment. See what I mean about prickly? Maybe on the edge of polite society. Maybe a little bit different. Uh, They're often strange and because of that, prophets are often misunderstood. And not only misunderstood, but often misquoted, aren't they? And often misapplied. As we come to this next part of looking at the whole picture of the Bible, we've got to work out who prophets are. Uh, I'm a simple kind of guy, so I'm going to do that with four simple questions. You'll see them there on your outline. We're going to work our way through them and see if we can get a bit of a picture of how they fit in God's big picture. Let me pray, and then we're going to look at it together. Dear God, thank you that you speak to us. Thank you that the words you give have been spoken and written down and then come in flesh. Thank you that as we sit here today, we can meet the prophets or at least some of them, think a bit about who they are and what they're doing and where they fit. Father, help us to listen to them, to listen especially to the very sharp question that they pose us as the people of God. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, you'll see there that the first question is actually a pretty simple one. I'm not repeating myself, but it needs to be asked again. What is a prophet? I'm at point two on the outline. And if you've got your Bibles there, turn with me to Exodus chapter 7. Because I think what happens in Exodus 7, the first reading that Ros brought us, sets up the template for what prophets are on about. Let me read Exodus 7, 1 to 2. The Lord answered Moses, See, I've made you like God to Pharaoh. And Aaron, your brother, will be your prophet. You must say whatever I command you. Then Aaron, your brother, must declare it to Pharaoh so that he'll let the Israelites go from the land. Moses has got a job. It's not a job he wanted. This one man has been commissioned by God to lead God's people out from slavery to the biggest superpower known at the time. Moses has a concern about the job. He stutters. He doesn't like speaking in public. That wouldn't be my concern about that particular job, but that's his concern. I don't know how to speak in public. So God gives him his brother Aaron to speak for him. 
Did you see how God described their relationship there in verse 1? You will be like God, Moses, to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, will be your prophet. Whatever you say, Moses, Aaron is going to repeat. And that's the job of a prophet. A prophet is a messenger from God, a a mouthpiece, a a foghorn, proclaiming what God has already told them. A prophet is a messenger from God. It's worth looking at a little more closely at what that means. And so turn with me to Exodus 19. Just flip a couple of pages back towards the back of your Bible, Exodus 19. Exodus 19. We've touched on Exodus 19 a lot over the last 12 months. Remember, God has saved his people. Moses has done his job. Uh, Really, God's done the job through Moses. They've come out of slavery. They stand at Mount Sinai. They're in the desert. They're outside Egypt. God is about to constitute them as his people. And God speaks to them through Moses. And this sets up the pattern for all the prophets in the Bible. They've travelled there, and then you'll notice there in verse 3, Moses went up the mountain to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain. Moses, come here. Notice Moses didn't choose the job. He didn't apply for the job. He doesn't have a resume or a CV. God says, come here. I've got a job for you. And do you notice what God does next? He then speaks to him. You must say to the house of Jacob and explain to the Israelites. I'm going to speak to you. Moses listens and then Moses goes and proclaims it to all of God's people to create a response. God calls, God speaks, Moses listens, Moses speaks. That's the pattern for all the prophets. God calls, God speaks, Moses listens, Moses goes and speaks. Now, despite their appearances, that'll tell you something about the prophets. They look funny. They look really funky sometimes. They look like they're inventive and a little radical. They're pretty bizarre and their methods are a bit unorthodox. But let me tell you, they're not innovators. They're not imaginative. They don't create their message. They just speak what God has told them. In many ways, that's a fairly simple job description, isn't it? It comes with a lot of other added things like yokes and underwear and lying on your side. But the job itself is very simple. So they're not foretellers, are they? They're forth tellers. They're not foretellers. They're forth tellers. They speak forth what God has already given them. Which brings us to our second question, when are they? It's always good to place people, isn't it? Uh, I was doing some interviews this last week with some people for an award and we asked a number of the people a question and their answers dated them. Uh, for example, who's your cricket hero? Well, none of the answers were Des- Dennis Little. When you, when you get answers, you can date people and place them, can't you? It's, we've got to do that with the prophets. Uh, let me be clear, they seem to occur right across the life of God's people. Moses, I think is the first and greatest. Do you notice how he provides the pattern? God calls, God speaks, Moses listens, Moses speaks. So he sets the pattern for the prophets. In fact, as he stands on the edge of that promised land in Deuteronomy, we'll find out in a moment that he then gives them their clear job description in the way he does life. After him, once they're in that land, remember we talked about that land over the last few weeks? Israel. You have the two great E's, Elijah and Elisha. They don't have books named after them, but they roughly serve one king's and then set the pattern and then you'll see that they deal in the north with a bloke called Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Good stories to read. Helps explain the way we use the word Jezebel in our society today. That's about the ninth century before Jesus. Then you move into the 8th century before Jesus and remember that God's people had a civil war, split up, had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The north, you had 10 tribes. That's called Israel, the southern, uh, south, southern kingdom, Judah. Up the north, you get people like Amos and Hosea. 
Hosea's the man who had to find that prostitute to marry to show how unfaithful God's people are. Uh, then in the south, you have people like Isaiah and Micah. Ros read to us from Isaiah. By the 7th century, you then move into the exile of God's people from the south and the north's already been taken away. You have people like Jeremiah, Ezekiel and Daniel. Daniel's pretty special because he actually does his work outside Israel, outside God's land, showing that God doesn't forget his people. And then God's people come back and as they come back, you get to the end of the Old Testament, people like Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi. From the 8th century, the prophets had their words written down. Sometimes it was by them, sometimes it was by close friends and they divide into the major prophets, the really long ones, and the minor prophets, the really short ones. And there's 17 prophetic books in the Bible. One very clear commonality. Speak God's word. Speak God's word. But let's just drill down a little. Uh, I'm at point four on the outline. What was their job? Can we be a little more specific about their job? I think we can. And I think if you want to go and read it, Deuteronomy 28 sets up their job. We read parts of Deuteronomy 28 two weeks ago. But do you remember that Moses is on that big plane. They're about to go over the river into the land God's promised. And Moses preaches three sermons just to remind them of who they are. Remember, they'd wandered for 40 years. That generation had died out. The climax is in Deuteronomy 28 where Moses says, you've got a covenant with God. God has committed to you and he's given you a job. What's their job? To represent God to the world. As you go into this land, as you go into this land, let me encourage you to represent God faithful. Obey him, show him, and life will go well. On the other hand, if you go into the land and you decide that that's really not your cup of tea and you don't really want to do that, you don't want to represent God, you don't want that job description, that's okay, really, because God will then hand you over to judgment and you can have life without him and you can be removed from the land. Uh, Moses is very clear. You've got a covenant with God. You've got a job to do. Go and do it. But if you don't, there'll be consequences. And so really Moses again sets the template because like in modern day action movies, he's an enforcer. He's enforcing the covenant. He's continually putting it before them and saying, this is what God has done for you. He's given you a job. Represent him. But if you don't, be aware that God always does as he says. As you think about that, and we'll unpick it a little bit in a moment, Moses is very clear that God's people will fail. And when they do, they will go back into slavery. He uses a picture of Egypt, but it's not really about Egypt, is it? Because when they reject God, who are they choosing? Themselves, aren't they? So they're not going back into slavery in Egypt, they're going back into slavery to sin. Back to the attitude that says, I can do a better job than God. Back to the attitude that says, I am in the middle. Back to slavery that leads away from God. And they'll stumble and they'll go back to that and God himself will never stumble. In Deuteronomy 30, Moses says, if you come back to God, he will be there. He will always do as he says. He has committed and he wants you back to be his people. So really the message they have as covenant enforcers has two parts. It's judgment and hope. And let me give you an illustration of judgment and this is not taken from my family. I just want to put that out there, okay? A Johnny's mum has bought him a new pair of shoes. In the small country town that Johnny lives in, it's just rained about 10 inches. Johnny wants to go outside with his new shoes. 
And his mother clearly says to him, not a problem, Johnny, but do not take them into the puddles or there'll be trouble. Johnny puts his shoes on, runs outside and comes to his first puddle and in Johnny goes. His mum calls out her warning. Johnny nods, hears, comes to the second puddle. You know what Johnny's going to do, don't you? Because you've done it. In Johnny goes. And mum calls out the warning again. Johnny nods and so on for puddles three, four, five, six, seven and eight. Johnny comes to the ninth puddle. In Johnny goes. Out comes mum. Mum brings Johnny kicking and screaming into the house. She grabs the wooden spoon. Johnny is shouting all the time, this is so unfair, mum. His mum calmly says, Johnny, I warned you when you went outside. I then showed you patience through eight puddles. I warned you each time, but enough is enough. You will now receive the punishment that I promised. Johnny's mother kept her word, didn't she? I wouldn't have been as patient. I wouldn't have gotten to nine puddles. That's immense patience. She warned him each time. He heard and then he got to the next puddle. That's God and the prophets and his people. Through Moses on the edge of the land as they're about to go in, God has been very clear. We've got a covenant. I am committed to you. Represent me. But if you don't, I will remove you from the land I'm giving you. Time and time again, God sends a prophet saying, we've got a covenant. God is committed to you. Represent him. Stop disobeying him. Come back to him or he will remove you. Well over 300 years, not nine puddles, well over 300 years, God shows that patience. His people even tried to trick him as if you can do that. So yeah, use their right hand to go to the temple to be regular at at the gathering of God's mob and to offer the sacrifices and to put the money in the plate. They did that with the right hand, but with the left hand, what were they doing? And the prophets kept coming. God's people abused his patience. They treated him and his promises as the biggest lucky charm they could find. Because, you know, God's not going to let us down, is he? They never thought God would keep his word. Does that sound familiar? That sounds exactly like Adam and Eve, doesn't it? Don't eat from that tree. You got everything else. If you do, you'll die. Ah, God's not going to do that. God's just stingy. So I'm going to eat. Hang on, God did exactly as he said. Isn't it good that God keeps his promises? God does exactly as he says. He judges his people. Isn't it good to actually have a God who always does what he promises? Always keeps his word? He removes them from the land he gave them because they wouldn't obey him. They didn't listen to the prophets. They continue to treat God as a right, not as a relationship. And so God pulls them out of the land. The Assyrians come, 722 BC, wipe out Israel. If you were here yesterday, let me tell you, please listen to, slight tangent, listen to the talks when they're online because they were terrific. But if you were here yesterday, you know the Assyrian policy. Their, Their policy when they invade is what? Just kill anything that moves. And so they did. There goes the north. Southern kingdom, a number of times the Babylonians come. The Babylonians are more brutal, but they're just as sophisticated. They actually go, hey, we'll just take the upper class and that'll just decimate the land. And God kept his word. Puddle after puddle after puddle after puddle and God brought his judgment. Their slavery is not geographical, is it? Their slavery is in their heart. They've decided to be their own God. And so God hands them over to that. They've decided to be slaves to sin. 
and not be saved by God and representing. That's the heart of the issue. And God always keeps his word. On the other hand, that means that God remains committed to that promise to Abraham that through this mob, mildly, stiff-necked, rebellious, stubborn, presumptuous, God will still roll back sin somehow, somewhere from Abraham's family. And so God's committed. And so he brings them back, doesn't he? You know the way the Bible works. So God committed to his people and he uses that judgment to purify them and to bring back a remnant, a small group. Some have got long memories when they come back, start crying when they see what's in front of them. But they've been saved by God. It's not actually dealing with their sin. That's to come. That's God's commitment. And so there's this mysterious figure that emerges at this time called the servant. We just read about him in Roz from Isaiah. And this figure called the servant is committed to dealing with sin by standing in and taking it for us, for any human being, from any nation, any background, and saying, I'll take that for you because I've represented God and done it perfectly. And so God says that through that servant, ultimately he will save his people from the real slavery, which is sin, and, and he'll, he'll recreate them, remake them. He'll give them a new heavens and a new earth. That, that sounds remarkable, doesn't it? I, I can't comprehend that. A physical place where I will dwell with God and look him in the eye and talk with him. And God will dwell with his people. And as he does that, God says that he'll make a new covenant. Jeremiah 31, verse 31, look, the days are coming, this is the Lord's declaration, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And do you notice there that God says he'll do it? And that new covenant will be a brand new heart that isn't making me God but has God as God. But it creates a really important question. How will God do that? We heard this question yesterday, how? How can God be God and have people like me hanging out with him? It's a constant tension in the Bible. Remember Garden of Eden? Obey me, they disobey, removed. Remember the land, obey me, they disobey, removed. How how can that be possible that God can hang out with people like us? That we can be remade? that our hearts can be changed. Uh, let me just give you a hint, and I think this is this is not due to any planning. I think it's remarkable that we're celebrating the Lord's Supper today because listen very carefully to what Jesus says in Luke 22, verse 20. In the same way, this is his last meal, in the same way he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Isn't that remarkable? That this bloke called Jesus who had no deceit, no sin in him would willingly go, I am going to be the way where a God who hates sin can live with people who always sin. I'm going to be the new covenant between people and God. And God will do it. I want to finish with a question. Point six, or at least a statement. Uh, what are we to do with prophets? There are lots of stuff we can do with prophets and we can keep talking about that and I want to encourage you to do that. But I, I think part of it is thinking and pondering about this statement. Let me, let me give it to you. God always keeps his word. We like that, don't we? We like that. Uh, and we should like it because it is good. As, as we heard yesterday, Here is the great antidote to so many of the weeds in our world. God always keeps his word. In a world where words are so worthless, God always keeps his word. In a world where we want people to be straight up and down, to do exactly what they say, God always keeps his word. In a world where I know that I struggle to even utter words that mean anything, God always keeps his word. Isn't that good? It's got a very hard edge though, doesn't it? Because where there is sin, what will God do? 
He'll judge. And where there is rebellion, what will God do? He'll remove. And where there is willfulness, what will God do? God will come and he'll purify. God always keeps his word. Such a comfort. Such an edge. And we stand caught, don't we? Because left to our own devices, God is stingy. He doesn't want the best for me. I can do a better job than God. How am I ever going to stand in the presence of God? Because God always keeps his word. Next week, you'll see how God does it. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the prophets. Our Father, we've really only scratch the beard if you like because we don't haven't really dived into the depths of who they are we've just bounced off the surfaces thank you that you sent these men and women to be your mouthpieces your messengers father we acknowledge as we turn those pages over we we acknowledge that we keep just jumping in those puddles and father that presents us with the hard edge of you always keeping your word father Please turn us to the one who enables sinful people to live with the God who always keeps his word. Please help us to meet Jesus. And next week, Father, we'll learn more about him as Neil opens uh, your very clear word to us. But Father, this week, help us to meet Jesus as the one who always keeps your word. In his name we pray. Amen. Any questions? Caelan, yep. So it's a really good question. I was, I've kind of half expected this question to come up. So I've done a little bit of work. Um, but, um, and we didn't organize this, did we, Kayleen? No, before. So it's not a Dorothy Dixon. We're not in Canberra at the moment. Um, uh, so the question is, we've talked about prophets and we've talked about the Old Testament prophets. What about the idea of prophecy in the New Testament or prophets in the New Testament? Have I got, understood your question clearly? I think the key is in the repeated phrase right throughout the prophets. Uh, which is always what? Can you, can you remember what it is? I haven't touched on it today, but if you know your prophets, the Lord says. The Lord says. The Lord says. So they're mouthpieces for God to call his people back to the covenant. I think the New Testament equivalent are the 12 apostles because what's Jesus commanded them at the end of Matthew 28? Go and make disciples, commanding people to do everything that I've said. So I think the Old Testament prophets have a New Testament equivalent in the 12 apostles only because their job is to say the Lord said and to bring people to the new covenant. Okay, Now, that's not something I've created on my own. I'm completely unoriginal with any thought. I'm really just a digestive tract for other people's thoughts. That's Wayne Grudem. He's written a lot on that. So if you want to look at that, which then raises a question, what about the prophecy that Paul talks about? Now, I think that's very important because I think one of the areas that he makes clear there, and especially at the start of Hebrews, is that there is no new revelation. So I think the prophecy we get in the New Testament is a God-given ability to have deep insight into the revelation we've already got which is why in 1 Corinthians it's put in the context of not creating new stuff but edifying the body that already exists. So that's my answer. You can come back with any other questions over morning too. Any other questions? Baxter, we haven't had one from you for a while, mate. Yeah, that's a great question. Did Moses have a choice to say, I don't want that job, God? I I don't think he did. I think that's one of the patterns which makes Jonah such a sharp little prophet, doesn't it? Because he is a prophet who doesn't want to do what God commands him to do. So, no, I don't think he had a choice, Baxter. Yeah, quickly. Quickly. 
No. So Baxter's asked, if Moses looked at God's back, would that have killed him? No, which is why God had such mercy to show him only his back. Any other questions? Come and talk. to That's an obscure reference. We'll talk to me later about that. Brian Hearn over here. That's a wonderful thing. <laughs> it was... Yep. Uh, no, it doesn't because we are then made disciples. And in the New Testament, the disciples have the job of representing their teacher. So we're not prophets, which means we don't get new revelation. But we still have to represent because when you get to 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, what does that quote? Exodus 19, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness. So we don't have option about representing God, but we're not prophets. <laughs>